we're all a bit, I want to say emotionally hungover from spring break. Some of us in actuality also. Um, so, I really, uh, so we don't have class on Wednesday. We got to, we got to get, uh, so today is really, um, I'm doing an example problem that will hopefully be a good review for the exam also. So, cool. yeah. So hopefully that helps out. Um, the, when we ended it last time was lecture 6-5 on Boda plots. And we went through and we, uh, we did the Boda plots for a bunch of simple transfer functions, right? And then we talked about combining them, but we didn't really do an example of it. So we'll do that. We'll do like, kind of like a pretty involved example today with that. So several of these sort of simple transfer functions will be composed into a more complex transfer function and then we're going to have to sketch the Boda plot. We'll also do a little bit of calculating things in MATLAB because as you guys may be aware, MATLAB's pretty powerful for this type of thing. So we'll do a little bit of that today as well. So here's the example we'll do. Given the transfer function h, answer the following questions and imperatives. And, and notice this is, sounds a lot like a test problem for me. <laughs> um, I'm not I saying this is going to be a test one, problem. Uh, but I, what I'm saying <laughs> is this, this example uh, is in the form of a test problem. So we'll, we'll learn as we go through it. But this is the type of problem that I, I expect you guys to be able to do on the exam. Okay. Well, minus the MATLAB part, obviously. So first, sketch a Boda plot on figure 6.6. Six. So I gave you a blank set of, of axes, a magnitude in dB, and a phase in degrees. So we'll sketch that as part of the example. Uh, and then B, confirm the accuracy of the sketch in MATLAB using the functions Boda and TF. So we'll do that as well. And then C, the input to a system with this transfer function is 5 sine omega t plus pi over 7. What is the output amplitude and phase for these different frequencies, angular frequencies of omega? And then we'll use MATLAB uh, to perform the calculations. We'll talk about how you do it by hand if you want to, but um, it's nice to be able to use our MATLAB tools as well to do those. So we'll go through and do this. So part A is actually the most involved part. So we look at this transfer function. What order is the system? Third order because the highest degree in the polynomial, or the, the degree of the polynomial is third order, right? In the denominator, therefore, it's third order. How many poles does it have? Three poles. Got to have three poles if it's a third order system. And how many zeros does it have? One zero. When s is equal to what? Negative one. Yeah. yeah, just negative, negative one. one. So we have the numerator zero, so yeah. And we've got this big scaling factor out front. So this obviously doesn't look like any of our simple transfer functions that we know what the Boda plot looks like from this above, right? But what I claimed is that you can decompose these transfer functions into uh, a, a higher order transfer functions into these simpler ones, right? So that's what we'll have to do first. And this is often, I mean, conceptually, a lot of times you guys get that, like you have to decompose it, right? But then how to actually go about that? So that, that's what we'll, we'll start with. How do you actually go about turning this into these simpler ones, ma making it match that form, okay? So the first step that I think is really important to do 
is it, it's always easy when you have numbers in here like this to find the poles, right? Um, numerically, you can do it. You could use MATLAB, you could use Mathematica, you could use the cubic equation if you wanted to. I don't really recommend that option, but you could find when the denominator is equal to zero, you can find the poles, right? Why do we want to know what the poles are? Why is that like our first thing that we're interested in? Well, I mean, you might say well, the poles, they dominate, uh, or they tell us how the system responds, you know, transient response. They tell us about the stability of the system. Is the real part negative and all that? So that's, but we often care about the poles. But specifically to, to sketch the Bode plot, we want to decompose this, remember, into these, these simpler first order, second order terms, factors. So we might have a case where we have three, we know we have three poles, we might have three real poles. If we have three real poles, we're just going to have a composition of three real pole transfer functions, right? And we know what those look like. So that, that would be good. Uh, what we might have, though, since this, there's third order, you might have two that show up as a complex conjugate pair, right? That could also happen. And then you would need to use this, this form, right, to look at the, the Bode plot. So we want to decompose it, but we don't, need, we don't know if we need to go into three real uh, root ones. So the, the real pole and real zero case, so this is the form of the transfer function for a real pole. We might have three of those, or we might have one of these and one of these. So we need to find out what we're working with here. You could try just factoring. I, I, I don't know. I wouldn't recommend that route. I just go ahead and fall uh, and and compute the poles. So first we compute the poles, and for this system, I went ahead and computed them. So you can use anything you want. You could solve a cubic equation or whatever you want. Uh, there's ends up being one real pole, negative 10, and two complex conjugates. So negative 50, that's the real part, plus j 86.6, and negative 50 minus j 86.6. So those are our three poles. Mm -hmm. If we compute the poles, we can either use at the uh, finding of those are basically the roots of the system, correct? That's right. So if, mm -hmm. Even though we just did it, you just did it off off camera, basically. Mm -hmm. we, what's the quick step how to do it? Is either just use the find the roots of it, basically? Yeah. So you just set this denominator equal to zero. And then just solve for s. And solve for s. Okay. Yeah. So it, whatever way you want, it's really kind of up to you. Um, it, when it's when we have all numerical coefficients here, like 110 and 11,000, etc. then even for really high order ones, it's easy to compute them almost, it probably your calculators can do this actually, numerically, so, yeah? On an exam, we wouldn't have a cubic like this, would we? Uh, potentially, um, uh, I wouldn't expect you to be able to necessarily, I, like, so if I was like, oh, hint one of the poles is negative 10, then you would be able to factor that one out and I would expect you to be able to go from there. Okay. Um, so like, I wouldn't expect you to be able to solve a cubic equation by hand. Um, and even though your calculators can do it, I'm almost positive, I don't usually like to have you guys rely on that to be part of it. Because it's not really the point of the exam. I'm not like, oh, can you solve for S? I assume that we already forgot how to do that before. So, <laughs> so uh, we have, we have uh, our poles. So what we've found is we have one real pole and a complex conjugate pair of poles. So we're working with, in terms of pole transfer functions we want to decompose down into, we have one real one, so one that looks like this. And then we've got a complex conjugate pair, which we want to write like this. Okay? So those are our poles. That's what we want to decompose 
into. Um, and then for zeros, there's just a real zero, right? There's a single real zero that we identified at the beginning. And so we're working with this case here in terms of decomposition. Yeah? For the uh, holes, mm -hmm. do you always have to have like a, when you have a conjugate, like complex conjugate, do you always have to have like a J that's positive and negative? Yeah. Okay. So the uh, complex conjugate always looks like sigma plus or minus J omega. So um, the plus is one of them, the minus is the other one. That's a complex conjugate pair. Always shows up like that. If you have one that's complex, mathematically you can prove that if you have one complex term, one complex pole, there's also a complex conjugate pair to that. It always shows up. In ter it, when you have a, uh, a transfer function with real coefficients, which all physically realizable ones have real coefficients. So, yeah. So we're safe. Always show up as pairs. Okay, so we've got we've got uh, our the, the beginning, right? So we, now we, we have identified what we want to sort of decompose this bigger transfer function into. So let's actually do that. Um, so factoring. We will rewrite our transfer function, h of s equals. We still have our 20,000. Um, I'll just put more zeros here. 20,000. Um, let's pull out the, the s plus 1. So 20,000 is a gain term, right? We also looked at that transfer function. And so we'll pull that out front. That'll be our gain term. S plus 1, there's our real 0 transfer function. Let's pull that out and have it be a separate term as well. And then we'll factor out this denominator into its separate components too. So we have 20,000, there's a gain term. We have our uh, S plus 1, which is our real 0 transfer function term. And then we have our... our uh, a real zero, and then we've got our complex conjugate, a, a real pole, and then our complex conjugate pair of poles. So let's do the real pole first. The form, so it's really important that we go back to look at what the form was. We need to write it in terms of 1 over tau s plus 1. Okay? So we know that the pole, so if we write it as s plus 10, that's, that's a start, right? We, haven't, we have to factor 10 out of that still, but this is getting closer, right? We're getting closer to what we, what we need. Um, uh, but if we factor out the 10, so we have to put a 1 tenth there, if we're going to write it like that. Um, uh, and then we've got um, times 1 over, so let's just factor out this whole, um, so if we, the way to factor out s plus 10 is of course to divide the polynomial, that our denominator, by s plus 10, and whatever's left over is what's left in this denominator. So we have, if you just divide s cubed plus 110 s squared, etc., by s plus 10, which I feel like you guys have done polynomial division before. Have you not done polynomial division? I don't know. Yeah. Do you guys factor out a term from a cubic? Have you guys done that? Once. Yeah, I mean, it's probably a little bit murky, but you could go back to it. I'm not expecting you guys to be able to do this, uh, I would say, super efficiently on an exam, I guess, factor out this term. I I'm not saying that I wouldn't expect you guys to be able to do it at all, but, like, I wouldn't expect you guys to be able to do it in, like, two minutes either. So go back, review, how would I factor out one term, s plus 10, from this whole thing? That may be a 
place to start. Okay, um, and s squared plus, you, get, you have left over 100 s plus uh, 10,000. Okay, so that's what's left. Um, and, yeah. Uh, also, I mean, if you wanted to reconstruct this and not factor it out, you could reconstruct it from this complex conjugate pair pool, which is probably messier than factoring it, but you could do it. There's too many ways to do this. It's like 50,000 ways. Just choose one. Go for it. Okay, so we've got this, um, and let's, let's rewrite this again, okay? So we're getting close. We've got our S plus 1. That one's already in the form we want, right? This is, this is getting close, but we do want to factor out that 10, right? So we need to do that. Um, Oh, one thing I did, I divided by 10, I didn't multiply by 10. So I should probably have like a times 10 out here. We're going to get rid of it in a second. Um, that was my bad. Uh, uh, I should have put it in the 20,000, right, because it's our gain term. I'll add a zero. Would that make people more comfortable? Put a zero in the hole there. That was, there was an empty spot. Add a zero. Or we can do times 10. We're going to divide it out in a second. So you can put the 10 anywhere you want. Um, so, so we've got our S plus 10. So this one, we know that we can factor out 10. And we're going to get 1 tenth S plus 1. And then, uh, oh, this, this was a 10 up here, right? OK. So. The thing you have to check is when you factor out the 10, does it cancel with this 10? So I did a 1 over 10. That was a mistake. It should have been a 10. And then I, I, uh, I should have taken away a 0 instead. It's my bad. So wait, uh, but if, yeah. you, if you factor out. <laughs> so it's 20,000, right? It's, it's still 20,000, but we're needing to take, we need to take 10 of it. Um, uh, uh, away. Oh, so, okay. right. yeah, so, so now it was twenty thousand, but we took we took a factor of ten. We stuck it up there, so we so got to remove it from over here. S plus one. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna settle this now. What? First of all, the problem started out with two hundred thousand, not twenty thousand. Oh, it did. Second oh, thank all, you for pointing that we out. We have two thousand right there, so we're gonna need to fix that back to two hundred thousand. Yes. Oh yeah, there's two hundred thousand. And it was two million when it was multiplied by ten. Okay, everyone good? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Aaron, for helping. Soft. So, let's let's start let's start let's start with the, let's do that step again. This was actually two hundred thousand. There were five zeros. It's a lot of zeros there. So five zeros. We're gonna borrow from that one of the zeros. Okay. So we end up with twenty thousand here. We took one of them and we stuck it there. That's all we did. We did that, we did that because we knew that one of our, our uh, uh, poles was negative 10, right? But we can't just simply, um, well, we're in a moment we're going to cancel this 10. We're just like looking ahead to the next step, canceling the 10. We, maybe we should have just kept it there. I like to do like multiple things in one step and it often gets me in trouble when I try to explain it to people. So that was my bad. And, and we're, we lost that time at the end. So you lost time 10 at the end because I, we now are just taking and we're taking away or, or putting zeros on the twenty thousand. Okay. So all that happened was we had two hundred thousand, and now we have twenty thousand because we took the ten out and we stuck it here. That's all that happened. So my bad on the confusion there. Completely my fault. So now we're getting really close. If we factor ten out of this denominator here. So I'll, I'll, write, I'll rewrite the 20,000, and then what we're going to do is we're going to start canceling some zeros out. But we'll do it very explicitly so everybody sees what we did. Okay? I'll rewrite the 20,000. I'll rewrite the s plus 1. This one, I'm going to factor out 10 from the denominator because I want it to look like 
this thing. So it needs to look like 1 over tau s plus 1. And if to, to be tau s plus 1, I have to divide by whatever is in that spot that's supposed to be 1, right? Which is in this case is 10. So I got to divide by 10 in the denominator. I got to factor that out. Fortunately, I have a 10 in the numerator, which, you know, I precogged. And so I knew that there was going to be a 10 I needed to cancel, which was silly. I should have just put it in there explicitly. So I end up with 1 over 1 tenth s plus 1. So this tau is 1 tenth, right? Okay. All right. And then we need to do something to make this. So this guy right here, we know that we're going we're gonna, to, uh, it's going to be a complex conjugate pair. So we've got to go up and look at that standard form. And it's a pole, so we're looking on the left-hand column. This is the zero case, but we're in a pole case, so we're left-hand column. So we need it to look like this. We, we already have s squared, so we don't need to divide by anything in the denominator. Uh, but we do need to identify what's omega n, what's zeta from this, which we've already been learning how to do. We already know how to do that to some extent, right? We already, we've already learned that, how to find zeta and omega n from a transfer function that's second order. We got this. So we need to identify omega n and zeta. And then we need to also make there be an omega n squared in the numerator. So that's why we're, we're going to start canceling 10, that, the, all these 20,000s, all the zeros from that. But we'll get there in a second. Let's first identify what omega n and zeta are. Okay. What is, so omega n is always the easy one. Square root of 10,000. Yeah, so omega n is the square root of 10,000, right? Which is what? 100. Math is hard. So omega n is 100. And this term has to be 2 times zeta times omega n. It's already 100. So, so if you wanted to do it explicitly, zeta is going to be equal to 100 divided by 2 times omega n. Uh, no, that was wrong. So this, this has to be, so 100, so I'll, I'll do it explicitly. 100 from this term here, this 100, has to be equal to 2 zeta omega n. Therefore, zeta has to be equal to... Oh yeah, so I did, I did that right, didn't I? Sometimes I doubt myself. I should never doubt myself. Except for earlier, I should have doubted myself. Okay, uh, and this gives us, so omega n is 100, 100 is canceled, so you get 1 half, right? So zeta is 0.5, so that means that we are what? Underdamped, overdamped, critically damped? Underdamped, right? It's between 0 and 1, underdamped. Cool, so this is like why this problem is kind of a review for everything, because we're like touching on a bunch of stuff that we've talked about, even though that's not like what the question asked explicitly. So, zeta is one half. Uh, okay, so we're, we're rewriting this in terms of that form, right? The standard form from uh, the graph above. So s squared plus two times zeta, which is 0 0.5, times omega n, which is 100, s plus 100 squared omega n squared we need to write 100 squared in the numerator too right because this is our omega n according to that standard thing omega n squared needs to show up in the numerator but in order to do that we had to multiply this term by 100 squared so we got to divide somewhere by 100 squared right you can't just multiply the numerator by 100 squared and then just say, yeah, that's good. Um, you got to divide it somewhere. So we're going to divide it out. So 100 squared is 10,000. So we're going to divide. We have all these zeros. We're going to get rid of them, right? So that's four zeros we need to get rid of. 10,000. 
So one, two, three, four zeros. Woo! And we're left with two times s plus one times one over one tenth s plus one times we could just we're just rewriting this now, right? One hundred squared divided by s squared plus 2 times 0.5 times 100 s plus 100 squared. So now we're like, we're factored. And, and if you get to this end, you're like, I don't know if I divided everything correctly or whatever. Like, I'm not sure that I factor this properly. Just multiply it all back together and see if you get what you started with. Because all we did was just factor stuff out. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is literally, so if, you, if you're like, ah, I don't know, did I do that right? You probably could double check by just multiplying it back out and seeing if it comes out right. So this is like when the, your math teacher was like, now you need to check. You need to do the calculation, then you need to check. This is that. But if you're dumb in, in drive, you're pretty much dumb in reverse. So, right? you, could, you could be like, I messed it up, and I, I did the same mess up backwards. Cool, I'm right. <laughs> you must have really been your teacher's pet in high school. Huh? I am a terrible student. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoy having you in class, Aaron. I just want to say that explicitly. You, you're cool. Thank you. You're cool. <laughs> Part of why I wanted to come back after spring break was so that you could be in the front row. Just bright eyed and bushy tailed, ready to go. So, <laughs> no, I also, like, always was questioning the authority of the teacher, and they never liked that. It was never, never something that was popular among them. But, but, so I, so I appreciate it. I enjoy it. Sometimes I don't, but mostly I do. Okay, so. We have this thing, it's all factored, right? Well, actually, we're not even ready for B. We haven't even sketched it yet. But we're finally ready to sketch it. And, but we went through this sort of like this long process, but I wanted to go through in detail. Yeah? Um, I'm confused why you um, do the 100 squared. Yeah. So I, we had just a one in the numerator, right? right. In this step. I, we identified what omega n was. And this is, so this second order term, we want it to look like this, right? Okay. But we have a 1 in the numerator. We want omega n squared in the numerator. So we just put it up there, omega n squared, but we just need to divide by it too. And that's why we divided by 100 squared, 10,000, and we got rid of all these zeros from the 20,000. We ended up with just 2. So we still have a gain term, but... So you notice that this is, this is what we do. We take, we borrow from the gain term, we put stuff back in the gain term, you know, so like for a while our gain term was huge, but then we recognize that once we put it in standard form, it was only two. Yeah. So now we're ready to sketch. What we do, remember, is we sketch the magnitude and phase of each of these separately. Uh, uh, at, well, we, we could do them each separately and then graphically add them. We'll do sketching each one separately and then we'll graphically add them. Um, even though sometimes you can skip that first step once you get used to it, we'll, we'll, we'll go one step at a time. So, uh, our first term that we need to sketch is just the gain term, two, right? So the gain term, if you, I didn't even sketch it, I didn't even draw it in the, in the uh, examples of simple transfer functions. The magnitude is just whatever the magnitude is in dB, right? So you have to do it in dB. And then the phase is zero. If, as long as it's a positive constant, the, the, the phase is zero. If it's a negative constant, the gain's, negative, or the gain's 180 or negative 180. Uh, so we have a positive constant, 2. We need to find out what it is in dB. And it's just a constant line in the in both plots, okay? So let's do that term first. So I'll do, um, I'll try to do some color coding here. So let's do, for the constant one, let's do red. So 
This is for, um, I'll say, gain of two. We have, uh, we have to do, calculate it in dB. So 20 log base 10 of two is like six point something. Okay, I, don't, I, I know that because I did it last night when I made these notes. So you could calculate it, but it's six point something. So it's a, it's, it's a constant line about here. It doesn't change with frequency, right? It just goes flat the whole way. The phase is if it's positive, which it was, uh, is just zero degrees. So it has no contribution. It, when you add zero to anything, it has no contribution, right? So there's that. So that term was pretty easy. We, we just checked off, so gain of two. So I will try to color code this too. So there was our two. Check, got that. Now our next term is a real zero, right? So let's switch over. I'll use, I want to say purple for this one. So uh, if we go back up here to our plots, remember what happens is we have a 0 dB contribution up until the break frequency. And after that, it's at positive 20 dB per decade slope. Okay. So that was our, we just need to find out what our break frequency is. Our break frequency is 1 over tau, okay? That was the, the break frequency. So 1 over tau, we talked about that last time. Um, for this, our tau is what? Tau is 1. Uh, so 1 over tau is? 1 over 1 is? Yes. Easiest question you had today. It's just 1. So our break frequency is 1. So we come along here. We go. We start out at 0 dB. So our, our break frequency is 1. 10 to the 0 is 1, right? So this break frequency is here. We have 0 dB. And our straight line approximation goes up there. And then it goes 20 dB per decade afterwards, right? So it's a straight line positive 20 dB per decade. And if we wanted to do some rounding, which we usually wouldn't do until the very end, uh, we could round that off to plus 3 dB at the break frequency. But we're, we're, we do straight lines usually first, and then we round at the end. It's a sketch. So we want it to be good, but it doesn't have to be perfect. Yeah? How do you know what angles right there? Uh, here? Oh, it keeps going. It just leaves the graph. So it, it does keep going. I just didn't go above 40 dB for the, um, for the graph. We could have gone up to 60, and then you'd have the whole thing. Yeah, it just continues up that way. It leaves the graph, though. Um, but it is, I mean, it's probably good when you're sketching like this. You know, you probably should, uh, you know, keep going to the end, um, even if it goes outside the graph. That's fine. Do that. So there is our uh, uh, real zero. Now we've got our real pole, right? So uh, uh, we'll do the phase one separately. We'll do the phase one separately. So we'll do the gain one first. Our real pole, let's do green. Okay, so green, and our break frequency, so it's just like the real zero, but flipped, right? So here it is. Uh, our break frequency is at one over tau. Our tau is one-tenth, so our break frequency is 10. I made these break frequencies nice and easy to find, just so that they're very distinct. They might be closer together than this, but it's a factor of 10 off. Wow, that's convenient. Um, so our, our break frequency is, is at 10. Uh, so we come down to our plot here, and um, it starts out at 0. Our break frequency is 10. So it's 0 up to 10. And then it goes at a, at a slope of oops. Negative 
negative 10 dB per decade, or negative 20 dB per decade, I should say. Okay. If it's per decade, wouldn't that be? So a decade is a decade is ten oh, uh, factor of ten. So oh, yeah. yep. twenty dB, and then one decade. So it's like one of these rectangles. And how are you assuming it's going negative there? Uh, because it's a pole. Because if it's a real if it's a real zero, it goes positive. If it's a real pole, it goes negative. Yeah. And then we have a uh, let's see. What's the next term? Ah, we've got our, our complex. Yeah, this is a fun one. So I'm gonna make, um, I'm gonna do this one in like the, like the light blue because I'm gonna use the dark blue to be the last line, so. Uh, light blue, so our complex conjugate pair, so complex poles. And, yeah. Beside those things, like gain of two is means twenty long base of two or whatever whatever it was. Thank you. Which is like approximately equal to six DB. Yeah, um, cool. So we've got our, our light blue, which kind of shows up. North Carolina blue, but man, they lost, didn't they? Um, I did watch a little bit of basketball over the break. Nice pick. Um, okay, they just haven't been the same since Michael Jordan left. So, okay, we've got our complex pulls. Uh, our complex poles uh, look like this, right? This is what we, we made it look like. So remember that this one, you have to identify which zeta you're working with. Our zeta is 0.5. It's like the yellow one. There's a little bit of a hump there, but it's pretty minimal. There's a little bit of a hump. So we draw the straight line, though, 0 dB up to the break frequency, and then negative 40 dB per decade after that. Okay? So I know we got to draw on our little hump afterwards. And so the straight line approximation is you start out at zero. Oh, what's our break frequency? It's the natural frequency. So this for the, the second order system, what's the break frequency? 100. Wow, I made the break frequencies 1, 10, and 100. That was like, you know, very contrived, right? They're usually not so nice on the decade. but So this is our break frequency. It starts out at zero, da, 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 da. it goes up, you know, we're gonna have a little hump here, but straight line up to the, up to the uh, uh, break frequency, and then negative 40 dB per decade, so this thing is like that, right? It drops off sharper than the first order ones. And then if we came back in, we, we could, it, we, we really should try to figure out how big this hump is, but it's not, it's not huge. It, we would smooth it out like that. Okay. Um, so this was our uh, 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 magnitudes. We got all the magnitudes in there. So remember, from this little argument here, we just need to add them because they're in dB. We can add them graphically. Okay. So let's do that now. It, this part is tough because this, you know, it's not going to be perfect, but we get a pretty good, pretty good idea. So let's do it. I'll do it in dark blue. So composite will be in dark blue. So we start out at, so what is zero plus six? Six. six. Oh yeah. So we're good for all this at six. Then Everything else is still zero, but we start to kick in this, oh, yeah. How did you determine how fast the complex pulls would be Ah, always 40 dB per decade at high frequency. So it, it is asymptotic to negative 40 dB per decade. And that's only for the complex pull. 
Only for the complex conjugate pair. That's okay. right. Mm -hmm. So 0 plus 6 gave us 6 all the way through here. And then we have 6 plus this line, right? So this thing's going at 20 dB per decade. So we draw that in um, up to this break frequency here. And then it... Is that supposed to go to 20? Uh, yeah, so this thing is going to go to 10. So it's going at 20 dB per decade, just like this line is. So essentially, it's the red line plus the purple line equal the dark blue line, which, yeah, is this. And then, uh, finally, we've got the green line. The real pole that starts kicking in at that break frequency, right? And that thing's got a, a negative 20 dB per decade contribution, which essentially cancels out the positive 20 dB per decade from the real zero, right? So the real pole and the real zero now are kind of like canceling each other's effect out, and we're, we're back to flat line, right? Then we've got this little hump that's associated with this guy here that we could draw in, superimpose, because it's just we're adding that on, so a little hump. And then uh, now we've got a negative, a negative 40 dB per decade contribution. So this thing is going to then look like negative 40 dB per decade there. So we could go in, we could smooth this out, you know, this, oops, this has got a more smooth transition, this is a more smooth transition. Um, in here, this, this region is really tough because you've got multiple contributions adding. This transition comes in. Our, we're a little murky in this region. We don't know, like, does this really increase there in this hump or is this about level? Uh, probably slightly. And then we know at high frequency, though, this is going to go off at negative 40 dB per decade, so we're pretty confident in that. So there's our magnitude sketch. The phase sketch actually tends to be even easier. Um, and so let's, let's do that one. We did the gain already, which was zero. No problem there. Yeah, question. Uh, how, how did you know the composite started with six, though? Mm. Because zero, so we're just adding them up. So we're, we're essentially doing, uh, we're just like adding as we go from left to right. So zero plus six is six. And, and in fact, we go from left to right just because it's easier to go from left to right. We could start anywhere and start just add things. So you, you can think about at any point, if you wanted to just compute a point on it, maybe in this transition region, that's a little murky. So we say this point plus this point plus this point plus that point, hopefully, equals this point. <laughs> so that's... That's what we're doing. We're just going along. We're just graphically adding as we go. Okay. So you guys have done this kind of thing with like your, you know, uh, moment, bending moment diagrams, shear and bending moment. Oh man, good old days. Okay, we gotta do phase. So phase. These contributions, the real zero hits first, right? So let's go back and review what the real zero does in terms of phase. It, contri it contributes positive 90 degrees. The transition happens from zero, goes through 45 degrees at the break frequency. And so typically our straight line approximation is one decade below to one decade above. Straight line in between that goes through 45 degrees. That's our contribution. So we'll, we'll draw that on there. Uh, so this one is the purple line, so I need to make sure I've got purple. So purple starts out, well, it would start out at zero. We actually, we're, you know, we're at zero back here, but then the break frequency is one, right, for the real zero. So we need, it needs to go, go through positive 45, and it needs to go up to plus 90. And we're going to go with a straight line approximation between those. So it's approximately that. And then it flat lines at 90 thereafter. The real zero has the opposite of that. 
contribution. So our real zero is green. So we use green. And its break frequency was at 10 to the 1, right? 10. So we go to, you know, start at 0 to one decade before it, the break frequency. At the break frequency, it's at negative 45. And at one decade above, it's at negative 90. So with a straight line in between and flat at negative 90 thereafter. And finally, our last one is our, uh, our complex one, right? So the complex one, we come up here. The phase goes from 0 to negative 180. Uh, we have this z equals 0.5. It, it's really not a great approximation to say it goes 0 and then it drops straight down, but that's typically how we do our straight line approximation, and then we just draw a little squiggle on there. So this is the biggest sort of approximation of them all here. Uh, so this one was the light blue, North Carolina blue. So we have zero, the break frequency is at 100. So zero contribution, the straight line approximation goes all the way up to the break frequency, drops 180 degrees, and the flat line's there. But in fact, we, we could go back and be a little bit more careful, but the, the real uh, contributions more like this, right? It's not great, but it's okay. So that's what the real contribution looks like. Um, and now we just need to graphically add them again. So same thing, right? Add the phases. We'll do dark blue. Start off at zero again, right? Um, we're going to actually follow because zero plus this up to this point is is just following that same line, right? So. 0, and then we go up to, oops, we go up to this line here, at which time, so 0 to 45, it goes at plus, uh, uh, the sort of plus 45 per decade slope. It gets canceled, though, with, by the pole that kicks in there. So we would straight line, we would sort of flat line there for a decade. At which point, we would start to get this contribution from the uh, uh, complex conjugate pair. So, I, you know, this is going to be, I'm trying to follow the, this, but up here, superimposed. So, we'll see how I do. I've done worse. Um, so, at the end, it, it, you know, we, we would actually do some, some uh, smoothing, but it it goes something like this, right? That's our phase contribution. So we've run out of time for today, but what I'll do is I will, I will put on, um, I'll finish the example, that was like most of the, that was like the main part. We, did, we went through it a little slower than I was anticipating, so I'll, I'll, go, I'll put up a part two lecture hopefully today, um, that describes the rest of the problem. Should give you guys a little bit more review. Study for the exam. I'm sure you'll do well.